last speaker is a lead designer director at Hangar 13 Games and was the lead gameplay designer on Mafia the Third. Previously, Adam was the primary combat system designer for Crystal Dynamics 2013's reboot of Tomb Raider, one of the best games. He has 19 years of experience as a game designer, has previously worked at Crystal Dynamics, LucasArts, Monolith, and Sierra Online. Put your hands together for Adam Borman. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, like he said, my name is Adam Borman. I'm uh, now the design director for Hangar 13 Games. And uh, Hangar 13 has offices in Nevada, California, uh, and Brno, and Prague in the Czech Republic. As the lead gameplay designer, I set the direction for moment to moment gameplay for Mafia 3. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we did in systems design and gameplay design, but I'll also talk a little bit about what we did in audio and um, narrative and art. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the things that, that we, uh, I felt like we did really the best in Mafia 3, uh, which was creating a, and capturing a sense of time and place. And what we strive for in Mafia 3 was to create an authentic sense of time and place, or what we call a cinematic realism. Basically what we mean by that is that we wanted the player to feel like it like they should, uh, like they felt, like they were really feeling uh, alive in that time and place, and not necessarily a hundred percent recreation of that time and place. We wanted to get a feeling of the overall authenticity, and we also didn't want to really uh, present a strong opinion about how the player should feel about it. We didn't want to get on a soapbox as developers, even though we had opinions about about things about the time and place but we didn't want to, we wanted to let the person experience it and kind of feel uh, what, what, how they wanted to feel about it. Um, we also presented opposing viewpoints through multiple characters and set up the, the world to feel authentic and then let the player experience it. And Mafia 3 is an open world crime game, but I don't think that the things that I'm talking about are really only for open world games. Um, I think that RPGs or adventure games or MMOs can, can use the same kinds of techniques. So a uh, little bit about what the story of Mafia 3 is and, and what the time and place we were trying to create was. Um, so Mafia 3 is the story of Lincoln Clay, who's a half black, half white um, uh, guy who grew up in an orphanage in New Bordeaux, which is our version of New Orleans. And as a teen, he was taken in by si Sammy Robinson, who's the leader of the black mob. He became a low-level criminal, but joined the army and went to Vietnam to try to get out of the life of crime. When he got back to New Bordeaux, he wanted to start fresh, but he found out that uh, Sammy uh, owed the Italian mafia a lot of money, so he offered to help them get out of the bind. Uh, after he helped, the, the Italian mob betrayed them and uh, killed the entire black mob and left Lincoln for dead. Um, he survived and reemerged six months later to get to start getting his revenge on Sal Marcano, who is the head of the Italian mob in New Bordeaux. And to, to complete this task, he recruit, recruits three underbosses, Cassandra, who's the leader of the Haitian gang, Thomas Burke, who's the uh, leader of the Irish gang, and Vito Scaletta, who is the um, protagonist from Mafia II, and kind of a, a low-level Italian criminal in New Bordeaux. So the game place takes place in 1968. 1968 was one of the most turbulent years in the history of the United States, maybe just behind the Civil War. The U.S. involvement in uh, Viet the Vietnam War had lost support of a lot of Americans, and black Americans had been fighting for civil rights throughout the 60s. And although all Americans were finally guaranteed the right to vote in 1965, there were still a lot of ways they could be discriminated against. In 1968, one of the big issues was housing, and there was a law passed in 1968 that you could not discriminate against someone based on their race or religion in deciding who to rent or sell a house to. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who had been instrumental in the struggle for civil rights in the 60s, was assassinated in April of 1968. Riots were seen in 100 cities after Dr. King's death. In Oakland, California, we saw the Black Panthers um, try to arm black Americans to try to 
defend their civil liberties through a show of force. In 67 and 68, Black Panther members were involved in shootouts with the Oakland police, leaving one police officer and one Black Panther member uh, killed. And then the KKK were continued to use fear and anonymity to try to fight against civil rights progress. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kev Kennedy's brother, who was running for president, was assassinated in June of 1968. And violence broke out at the National Democratic, or De Democratic National Convention in Chicago um, between protesters and the Chicago police. This is just a small glimpse into the events of 1968 and why we chose it as uh, the year for our game. It was really a hotbed of this tension in America between all of these different forces, the, the Vietnam War and um, the social injustices and racial injustices of the time. So then New Orleans. Um, our game takes place in New Bordeaux, which is our version of New Orleans. The real New Orleans is a city with a rich history and a unique feeling. Originally a French colony, then Spanish, back to French, and then sold to the United States in 1805. The city has a rich mix of cultures with um, the early immigrants to the city being French, Italian, German, Creole, African, Irish, and American. Uh, because of it, where it uh, because of its location where the Mississippi River meets the sea, it's always been an important port uh, f for trade and travel. And it has iconic architecture in many different neighborhoods and really kind of feels like no other, uh, other American city. It's also known for its lively party atmosphere. With 1.2 million people visiting New Orleans during the two-week uh, Mardi Gras celebration every year. And New Orleans is considered to be the birthplace of jazz, and it's a city with a rich musical history. Live music is played uh, in clubs and on the streets and in, in parks. It's, it's really everywhere in the city. And the bayou, which is a large swamp on the edge of New Orleans, um, is a vibrant and crazy place with lots of weird, like, moonshine, all kinds of, and alligators. Um, I am deathly afraid of alligators, so they will show up many times in this presentation. Uh, <laughs> so that's just a little bit of setup of what our time and place is, and now I'll try to talk about uh, what we tried to do in Mafia 3 to try to recreate that time and place. So the three main areas I want to talk about are time and place in the background, uh, which is kind of the setting of the game, and so that I would include the, creating a living world and a reactive population. And then I'll a little bit about time and place in the foreground, and that's uh, what I talk about is uh, creating a personal connection between the things going on at that time and place and the protagonist. So creating a living world. Um, first, we went to uh, create our I version of an iconic city, and I'll talk about a little bit about how we made decisions that we did. Um, bringing that city to life, and then a little bit about the soundscape and the audio uh, that we we used to bring more things to life. Um, so here's a map of the real New Orleans. You can see that it's surrounded by a lot of natural barriers. There's lakes, the Mississippi River, and it all keeps it constrained to a fairly small area. Um, within the borders of the city, only 350,000 people live. Uh, and a million in the total surrounding area. That's about half the size of Krakow. Um, looking at the major areas of the, the city, uh, the places that people know the best, like the French Quarter and, and downtown and Canal Street, are actually fairly small um, and not necessarily the best place they would be in a, in a, for gameplay. So our version, um, New Bordeaux, we actually moved things around. Uh, we made the French Quarter much bigger, the size of a neighborhood that is the same size as everything else. And um, we moved everything more centrally so that when the player's driving around the open world, that they cross through the more iconic areas more often. Um, we also moved the bayou closer uh, so that it would be easier for the player to encounter it and have more uh, um, dealings with the different kinds of feel for different kinds of areas in the city. Um, we also uh, increased the amount of water. Um, we still have the Mississippi w River as the major 
component of the city, but we also added more waterways. One of the reasons we wanted to do this is to break up the city a little bit more, but we also added boats as a new feature from Mafia 3, and so having more water meant we could use boats more often. Um, so this is just a few pictures of what the city ended up looking like, and I think that we did a really good job of kind of creating the, the feel of that New Orleans-type city um, with, and uh, it really does kind of capture that, that feel, feeling as the setting. Um, and it, of course, we have the bayou and we have alligators. And part of the, uh, creating an authentic feeling city is giving it personality and character and history. And one of the things that we did, um, our original, one of the, the working title of our, our town was Bourbon City. Um, but we, we gave it a history and a storyline of what happened uh, as the city developed. And I think that that helped create the different neighborhoods and we understood what the buildings were and where they came from, and one, the buildings that were super old or the buildings that were new. Um, there's a lot of American cities that don't have a history to them. New Orleans is, and New Bordeaux now are, are ones that do have a rich history, and so we wanted to kind of build a city that had a history. Um, we also wanted to give the feeling that people work and live here, that this, the city has been lived in, and kind of uh, there's, there's people here that, like, like, you, you see uh, the age of things. Um, there's a lot of really great advertising and posters and graffiti and signs on businesses that really feel like they are of the time, but that some of them would be from earlier. Um, and it really, the, the world shows where and its age and its history. Um, another thing that we wanted to kind of capture was uh, the feelings of what it was like to live in the South in, in the 60s. And the Jim Crow laws were state and local laws in the southern United States that allowed public buildings, businesses, um, drinking fountains, bathrooms, restaurants to be segregated. These started in, in, uh, after the Civil War, after the, uh, abol the abolition of slavery, and they ended in the 60s through the hard work of civil rights activists. They, although they were made illegal in 1965, we really felt like we needed to include this to kind of give the feeling to the player of what it would be like to live through this sort of experience. So then the next thing we wanted to do is populate that city. Um, and the population of the world consisted of a number of groups, civilians, police, and many types of gangsters. Um, the civilian population was made up of a huge variety of people broken down by gender, race, income, age, and bias. And for us, bias meant whether or not they were racist, which came into play in a lot of the, the gameplay that we had with our uh, civilians. Um, so the narrative team then took those variables and created 40 different character biographies for archetypical citizens. They gave them each names and then wrote a script for them. Each character had reaction lines, greetings, conversations, and had about 500 lines each. So we had, and we had 40 of them, so they had about 20,000 lines of civilian dialogue. And here's just an example of, of what those looked like. Um, and so we took those, and the next step was uh, taking all of these, these people and populating the city. Um, and we use the same demographics when populating the city. So in one neighborhood, we could have more black people, and in another, we would have more white people. In some areas, we'd have working class, and others, more upper class. And then we'd spawn randomized sets of clothing based on these features, and um, then one of those 40 voices would be applied to them based on their characteristics. Um, so one of the things that when I was working on this system, we realized that because we had uh, the demographics so carefully done, um, each neighborhood would end up with only one or two voices. Um, so I ended up say, realizing that we had a racist voice and a non-racist voice, and the, really, the difference wasn't in the voice, it was in their reactions and their behaviors. And so I could give the, make both of those voices work on both characters, and they would say nice things or, or rude things based on their reactions and their behavior, not 
um, based on their, their dialogue. And so I was able to take two voices in each area and, and increase them to six or seven, which um, when you have a great plan, it, it, you, it doesn't always work out and you have to adjust and figure out what, what's actually gonna work on screen one, once you have all of the assets in hand. Um, to add more specific characters to neighborhoods, uh, we added things called world interactions. And world interactions were our smart objects that made people do contextual actions in specific places. Um, they were uh, one of the main ways we brought the city to life and tried to capture the essence of life in 1968. This helped uh, create a feeling of authenticity and believability to the world. Uh, they were made up of specific or random characters that could be spawned or attracted. So as you move through the city, you would see someone um, be spawned into a hot dog cart or a, a, um, you know, a store or something like that. Or you could see someone walking down the street and then go and buy a hot dog from that hot dog cart. Um, they had uh, animations and scripted logic, and they were paired with audio and voiceover. So these could be simple things like a shopkeeper sweeping the sidewalk outside of the shop, or very elaborate things like a jazz band or a protest that synchronized many characters. Um, people buying hot dogs, I had to include this one because when we built this system, this was the, the thing that we talked about all the time. I don't know how many people buy hot dogs in New Orleans, but this was like our, our example. Um, well, what if someone needs to buy a hot dog? How are they gonna move around? And how does this guy work? And what happens at night? Where does the hot dog guy go? Does his cart go away? We had all of these questions and we, uh, we developed them around the, the case of the hot dog vendor. Um, we had everyday things like people buying newspapers, or more specific things like mourners at a cemetery, which helped bring those locations to life. As the player moved around, he would overhear bits of conversations, which we used in three main ways. The first was to give the civilians a little more life and to make them feel like they were real people with hopes and dreams and sick kids and terrible jobs. And the second was to they make comments about current events from the 60s, things that they saw on TV, or how they felt about uh, things going on in global politics or the Vietnam War. Um, and the third thing we tried to do was comment on the things the player was doing in the story or what was happening in the neighborhood during the story. And I think that this, this really helped the, the people, in the, gave the civilians the feeling like they knew what was going on around them. They weren't just mindless guys walking down the sidewalk they really understood what was happening and what the player was doing and how it was changing the world. We also wanted to have musicians playing live music as you move through the city and uh, try to capture some of the feeling of Mardi Gras. And I will try to play this video, which we'll see how good it looks on this giant, giant screen. <laughs> We wanted to capture the sense of political activism in the 60s, so we had a number of places where people are protesting. Here's an anti-war protest and a civil rights protest. And we also had a number of places where people were uh, doing voter registration tables. Um, and to ca capture the uneasiness and sometimes outright violence between police and people, we had scenes of police violence in different places parts of the game. This is the same anti-war protest, but now all the people have been arrested and they're kicking that guy on the, on the ground. <laughs> we also had uh, police harassing interracial, interracial couples. And uh, one of my personal favorites, which kind of shows all of the world interactions coming together, was a heroin den hidden underneath a jazz club, which tries to ca capture the psychedelic look and feel that became popular in the 60s. 
Anything you want here. Anything at all. I'll just have to trust you on that one, sugar. It wasn't so bad. Hell, they pinned a the metal on me before they shipped a box back from Nam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, but your brother was an ass hoe. Asshole. Huh. Sorry. Nah. I mean, you for that. yeah, you're right. The first time we got stuck, stuck up the on the me, boss, I had a baseball bat around me, and I'm going to stop that she knocked up on the house. We got some pop while she was split. Couldn't shoot for nothing. I got a little bit of a bad children. He is the kiss one. Where we are. All of those voices going together is one of the things that, that, like what I, one of the things I want to talk about that's really hard to do in open world games is build a lot of systems and then have them all work beautifully together. So <laughs> that's a good example of where it could have worked a little bit better is having a way to make the, the player be able to focus on one, one set of conversations at a time. Um, the other thing that really brought the, the time and life to play, or time and place to life that I want to mention are the vehicles and the vehicle traffic system. One thing that the, the Mafia games have always done really well is uh, capture that sense of what it was like to drive a car from the era and, and then also having the backdrop of these cars and having cars from the 50s and 60s driving around and parked and one-way streets and large part highways was one of the, the constant glues that kind of made the fitty, city feel like a city in the 60s and driving these cars, uh, we, I thought we did a really good job of making them feel like the real cars from that time. Uh, cars were also populated a lot like pedestrians. We could control which cars we wanted to have in each district, uh, how dirty they were, how rusty they were, and uh, who is driving them. So we didn't have little old ladies driving big delivery trucks, which happened a lot in development. But, um, Audio played a huge role in making the sound come to, or the city come to life, aside from things like we, we've talked about with conversations and traffic and music clubs and musicians, we had a lot of things happening in audio. We had the, the kind of the sounds of life. We had uh, the music of the 60s, and then we had a radio. Um, I'll just play a little clip of kind of what the city sounded like uh, and how just walking through a space, even though it's beautifully arted, having the, these sounds really brought a whole new level to the feeling of life. As you move around the city, you'll hear different sounds everywhere, construction, mechanics, garages, insects, lawnmowers, and these sounds change based on the time of day and the area that you're in and really do a good job of making the scenes feel alive. And there was a lot of really clever things done with these um, by the, the sound designers. There's actually uh, sounds like lawnmowers and sprinklers and, and things like that that, that don't actually, uh, there's no world interaction or a, a person doing or uh, mowing a lawn, so as you're moving around, you'll hear someone mowing a lawn, and, and it's a 3D sound, so as you get closer to it, it feels like you're getting closer to it, but then when you get there, it will, since there's no one mowing the lawn, it vanishes, and then, or it'll reappear somewhere else. And the same thing is, is true of the, the mechanics garages. Uh, you can hear people working on cars, but then when you'd be act actually be able to see the, the garage, the sounds have vanished, so maybe everyone took a lunch break. Um, and that was a way that the sound designers did a really good job of kind of helping everyone else to, to make this, the city feel even more alive. Um, we had, for music, we had over 100 licensed songs from the 50s and 60s, which definitely helped us create a sense of time and place in the game. Because our focus was on cinematic realism, we actually have songs from 1969 and uh, a few songs from the 70s, because they're close enough and they have the right feel to them. Um, and because the player is in the car so much, 
They have this constant soundtrack of great, time, or great songs from the time. We also had radios in the world which designers could use to, to uh, put on specific stations and it would give the, a specific space a particular feel. Uh, we also had our, our uh, recorded soundtrack uh, which ha was a rock, blues, and jazz inspired um, score which we recorded with live musicians in uh, Nashville, Tennessee which gave us kind of a, an authentic southern feeling um, soundtrack. And music was only part of what we had on the radios. We also had a number of radio advertisements um, in the style of the 60s radio, and they would also advertise things that you'd find in the game, like there was a butcher shop that was the front for a, a criminal operation, and you would hear advertisements for that butcher shop. We also had news broadcasts that would interrupt whatever channel you were listening to, and they gave story updates and talked about things uh, that were happening in the world, but also would talk about the player's actions. The next big thing we had was a few radio shows. Um, one of them was an ultra-conservative radio show uh, by Remy Duvall called Native Son, which was played by uh, Nolan North, and he did a great job. Um, we talk, in that radio show, we talk about Southern values and how the civil rights movement was threatening them. And he has guests on that talk about how things were going on in the story as well as the black rights movement. We also have a pirate radio show called The Hollow Speaks, which is, kind of gives the opposing viewpoint. And it's focused on promoting civil rights and Lincoln ends up uh, working with the host a few times. After we created the world and uh, and populate it, we wanted to make it reactive to the player's actions. We did this in a few ways. Um, we had the civilians react to the player and his actions, and we did some interesting things with the police system that I want to cover briefly. And the last thing was the enemy reactions and how the enemies react to the player in different situations. We had a number of different ways that uh, we could react to things that the player was doing. The simplest one we called encounters, and the more complex ones were reactions. Um, we also could, we had a few different kind of complex behaviors that we used to do things like uh, calling the police and shopkeepers. So encounters are basically just two people looking to each other, or as, as they approach each other, um, we decide should they say something to each other, should they greet each other, um, the simplest one was that we had people just look at Lincoln as he passed them, and because he's so tall and big, um, it, was, uh, it wasn't that strange that everyone started looking at him, but we did, based on where you were, we actually had ended up having more white people look at you than black people, um, and we'd have more black people greet you than l white people. Um, and that was more systemic than... It, it wasn't necessarily a, a thing that we chose to do, but it was the way that the system ended up working. And greetings were reactions that worked in a very similar way. Uh, people would s greet each other or wave or say nice things to each other, um, but if they were racist and they didn't like the person who was approaching them, they would say something rude. Um, and then that person would have a chance to respond. So if you were in an area that was uh, primarily a white neighborhood, people would often say negative things to the player when he was walking around. They would, uh, like, I, don't, I think you're in the wrong neighborhood, or I don't like you, the way you're looking at me. Um, and so, but they would also say that, that kind of thing to each other uh, as civilians. We also uh, wanted the world to react to the, everything that the player was doing. And so if the, they saw the player doing something strange, like taking cover here, uh, people would start watching him. And if a crowd grew big enough, it would attract the attention of enemies. And pedestrians could also react to each other. Um, and because most of the player's actions were violent, because it is a crime game, um, the most common reaction was to panic or to react to something, then panic, and then run away. Um, this caused a lot of problems in some mission areas because panicking civilians would alert other people and it would potentially disrupt other story moments. So we ended up saying that panicking civilians in story content 
didn't alert anyone else and they just run off quietly. It didn't look as good as it could have and this is another case where when you're building giant open world systems, you really need to figure out the best way to have them uh, interact with, with each other and uh, really give yourself the, the time to polish that sort of thing, to really figure out what the best option is um, when, you, when, you, uh, have, when you run into problems like this where things are working unexpectedly. Um, because we wanted to show some of the uh, the way that the life during segregation was, we did have stores that had signs saying whites only, and if the player walked into these stores, the shopkeeper would see you and tell them to, or tell you to get out. There wasn't a lot to do in the stores, um, so it ended up being more of a narrative moment, but we did want to give the feeling to the player what it would feel like to be in this time and place and have people react to you just because of the color of your skin and not because of anything that you had done. What the hell do you think you're doing? Stick around. I'll let the police deal with you. Watch. Oh. Pardon me. Hey, watch where you're going. I'm oh. gonna see you, boy. Um, in the 1960s, there was no cell phones, so we wanted to have a police system that was a little uh, interesting and realistic, um, so civilians would have to, when they wanted to re report crimes, they would have to run to nearby police officers or to uh, phones. And we had a lot of logic behind the scenes between, to figure out who the best uh, witness for a crime was and then which phone that they should run to. But then the player could go choose and try to stop them, which might cause another crime, which would have another person go run to a different phone. Um, in the clip I'm showing, the person that I'm committing a crime against is the only person around. So they're also going to be the one that runs and calls the police. Um, it also shows that not all of our pedestrian voices react to the same ways as um, to different things. So the, the woman re reacts aggressively when I, when I start pointing a gun at her, but then she becomes a witness to a crime and, and goes and runs to the phone. You feel big and strong now? Oh Lord, I'm calling the police! Please send some officers down here. There was already a cop there. Um, which actually brings me to the next point. Uh, so this is a great time to talk about the police system in Mafia 3. Um, so in, in 2015, the average time in New Orleans for the police to respond to a 911 call or an emergency call was 79 minutes. Even in the more rich neighborhoods, it would take 20 minutes for the police car to, to arrive. So we did a few things to talk about what this would be like in, the, in this neighborhood um, or in this town. So the first thing we did was uh, we have a certain number of police based on the neighborhood. So in poorer neighborhoods, there are no police patrolling the area, and it takes them a long time to get the, to the neighborhood. Um, and as you get to richer neighborhoods, more and more police are start patrolling the neighborhood. Um, so we also changed the speed that police arrive based on which neighborhood the play, player was in. Um, so we have the number of police patrolling, uh, the speed of reactions, and then the di dispatcher would also kind of tell you exactly what it was that, that they were doing about that, um, why they were reacting slower or faster. So if you were in a neighborhood, in one of the poor neighborhoods, the police would say something like, oh, somebody shot some, some guns off in this neighborhood. If someone's nearby, could you go and, and react um, and check it out? But if you were in a rich neighborhood, they would panic and they'd say, someone get over there, really not, right now. Um, and so we really kind of tried to f make you feel like the police cared more about some citizens than others. 
Um, and one thing that's, that's true in the United States today as it was in the 60s, that if you're black or you look out of place, the police will pay attention to you. In 2013, a study found that black drivers were 30% more likely to get pulled over than by police than uh, white drivers. And what we tried to do is a, uh, authentically model what it would be like to be a character that stands out in 68. If you get to, close to a cop, they'll watch you for a while, and you can tell that they're watching you. And if you do some certain actions, they'll become hostile to you. Um, and here's a quick video of what this looks like in practice. And we did give the cops sixth sense so you can't sneak up on them. We want time. Huh? I love that old bird, but mama's got to stay out of my business. I were you, I keep moving. Oh, How you doing? I were you, I'd keep moving. Um, so a little bit about the enemies. New Bordeaux has a lot of uh, territory that's controlled by the mafia and a lot of places where people were doing illegal things. We wanted enemies to react appropriately when they saw the player trespassing in their area. We had enemies that were just hanging out, and which were which would pretty much just ignore the player unless he started being aggressive towards them. We had enemies in some semi-public areas, um, which we called trespassing zones. If the they saw the player there, they would tell him to leave before trouble started. Um, and these always had a good level design context with natural f uh, feeling boundaries. We spent a lot of time working on the ways enemies escalated to combat in these areas. A lot of time. Uh, <laughs> And the last areas were uh, hostile zones, and enemies who saw you in a hostile zone would just attack on sight. And we use these for missions or inside hideouts, mostly. So the most complicated was the trespassing behavior, and I'll show you a quick video of what that looks like in-game. Huh? Your tag don't belong here. I think he headed that way. Got no need for coloreds around here. <clears throat> Why am I still looking at you? Huh? Fuck you doing back here. When I say move, you move. couldn't stop myself, I had to shoot him. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the last major thing I want to talk about is the protagonist coming into contact with the time and place. And what I mean by that is the story is a revenge story. It's not a story about racism, it's not a story about the Vietnam War, and it's, it's not really even a story about being in 68 in the South, but those are the things, that is the setting and those are the backdrop. Um, but there are a number of places in the story where those uh, things come, to, to, uh, come into play with the story and with the characters and what uh, Lincoln is doing. So the first one is Marcano. And first and foremost, Mafia 3 is still a story about organized crime and the Italian Mafia. And what's interesting about the end of the 60s is up until that point, the mob was able to operate fairly freely without much worry from the police and... Um, and, or from the FBI. But starting in the 50s, the, the FBI started putting pressure on them. And in the late 60s, with heroin becoming big and other players starting to enter the scene, um, the mob really had a lot of pressure on them. And in 1972, the RICO Act was passed, which made it much easier for, to arrest people just for being part of a criminal organization. And so Marcano can smell this coming, and he wants to go legit. He's got an elaborate plan to uh, make sure that he's got a legitimate business that he's running. And he's not trying to get out of the mob uh, necessarily, but he is trying to get a legal business that's going to make sure that the government doesn't have a case against him. And so he's building this giant hotel casino north of the city and working with a state senator and a corrupt judge to try to legalize gambling before it opens. Um, Lincoln uncovers this plan and tries to dismantle it. 
So the second part, something weird just happened on my screen. Um, the second part is uh, the hollow, which is the neighborhood that was controlled by the black mob until, um, until Lincoln, uh, it just got worse. So uh, the hollow is the, the neighborhood that is controlled by the black mob um, until Lincoln is killed or left for dead. And while he's in a coma, it's taken over by the Dixie Mafia, which is a real uh, crime organization that was controlled um, out of Mississippi in the American South. And uh, in our version of the Dixie Mafia, they're run by a guy named Richie Doucette. And he kind of takes over the, the neighborhood. And it's a black neighborhood, but now it's being run by white racist criminals. And um, so, the player, or the, Lincoln is, is offended by that, but also so is, um, uh, Charles Laveau, who is a civil rights activist and runs the pirate radio show, The Hollow Speaks. Laveau's goals are to make the government pass laws to protect the rights of all citizens, echoing the goals of Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders of the 60s. So Lincoln hunts down Richie Doucette in an, and his men in an abandoned, flooded amusement park. Um, and Lincoln takes back over control and gives it to Cassandra, who's the leader of the Haitians, and they turn the club back into a jazz club, which Lincoln, or Richie had turned into a strip club. Um, so the second part is Remy Duvall and the Southern Union. He's not only the, the ultra-conservative radio host of Native Sun, but he also owns the land where Marcano's building his casino. He's um, the head of the local Southern Union, which is a white supremacist hate group like the, the KKK in Mafia 3. Um, Lincoln's not actually after the KKK or the, the Southern Union, but he's after helping whoever is building the casino, and he comes into contact with them. And during the showdown, um, when Lincoln tracks them down, he's, uh, Remy is giving a speech at a Southern uh, Union rally that's a lot like the real scenes that we see from KKK K rallies at that time, complete with a burning cross. Cassandra's ag uh, agenda in New Bordeaux for Lincoln is to capture gun stashes around the city and bring them to her so she can arm all the citizens of Delray Hollow. And this is reminiscent of the Black Panther's goals in Oakland. And we have other characters in the game that show different viewpoints of how the civil rights movement should be done. Uh, next week, we're gonna release our second DLC called Stones Unturned. And in that, we're gonna get more into the, the feelings around the Vietnam War and show different uh, um, viewpoints about America's involvement in the war. And so, we talked a little bit about why 1968 was an important year in, in American history. And we talked about New Orleans and our version, New Bordeaux, and how it's a city with a rich history that we wanted to give an authentic feel, but, but make it better for supporting gameplay. And we talked about creating a living world and a reactive population, and giving the protagonist a per personal connection to that time and place. And our goal is really a cinematic realism and an authentic feeling experience. Not necessarily presenting a viewpoint, but presenting the feeling of the way things were in 1968 and allow the player to experience aspect of what it would be like to live a life in that time and place. And that's it. Thanks. Anyone have any questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, I remember that at uh, one time uh, you showcased a shop and uh, you said that you wanted to uh, emulate the feeling. How does it feel when somebody has a certain attitude towards you as a player uh, in spite of you did anything? Uh -huh. My question is, are there any NPC comments that uh, are connected to the actions that the PC took? Uh, 
Yes. And especially if there are any uh, dialogue lines that would uh, explicitly or implicitly convey some moral uh, evaluation of those actions. Um, yeah, most, mo actually most of the, um, the things that the pedestrians react to are based on actions that the player does. And they, if they are a racist character, they will say negative things about what you're doing and how they feel about you. Um, and so, yeah, that's the... the yeah, I mean, uh, I know that because yeah. I remember you said, um, maybe I didn't uh, speak sure. clearly. I mean, uh, there are some uh, storyline quests, uh, some major activities, not just walking and looking. Right. I mean, actions like that, do they... Uh, oh, so does, does do actions the player take... Uh, yeah change the, well, there are, there are conversations that you overhear based on actions that you do um, few, later in the game. So as you're moving through the city, you can hear people talking about you, um, but there's probably not anything that changes based on what the player's done in the, in it previously. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, I got a question. I'm here, hello. I see you. Okay. Uh, I, I like to ask about the voiceovers for the civilians. How many of them there was in the game? There are 40 different characters, and there's about 20,000 lines of dialogue. 40 different characters. Yeah. And you have obviously women, men. Did, yes. you, did you have as well black people, white people? Yes. Yeah, and so we had, um, it was basically, we had a lot of different, so we had older people. Um, both male and female, both black and white. We had um, younger people. We had kind of a, a mix. Um, but yes. Uh, so, um, but there was the same voice for uh, all, uh, for for the same the same character have always the same voice, right? Um, it they randomized between different voices, so they had six different voices that they could be. They, they could get based on what their um, their demographics were. Oh yeah, right. But what I'm asking is uh, if there if you meet a woman and you meet her again, she has the same voice. For uh, for named characters, yes. And I don't count those in the c civilians. Actually, for the named characters, we had a, a whole uh, other thing where, but but randomized characters is what I was talking about here. Okay, there was there was example with the woman who was uh, you trying to assault her. Yes. And at the first he was uh, he was tough, but the second he was uh, trying to yes. call the police. Right. That was the same voice. Yes, it was. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, I have yes. a question. Um, how did you approach uh, researching the era of the game? Because it's been like 50 years. Yes. Give or take. So, um, did you use? Did you just rely on people's experience, uh, or maybe you know you had some people from from the area and they could provide mm -hmm. some insights, or was it like a more systematic approach with some kinds of archives, or maybe it was just pop culture like films? And uh, what did you use to research I think the era? The 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 main things were were books and films and documentaries. Um, and then we did talk to a lot of people from the, the time and the place. And like we did, we actually have a lot of people on the team who are from the South. And so whether they experienced it themselves or um, they, their parents did or experienced what it was like to grow up at that time, um, we had a lot of uh, firsthand knowledge, knowledge on the team as well. Um, okay. But yeah, the, fir the first, first place was books and then also documentaries and other films. Okay, because um, what I'm wondering is that documentaries and books will mostly give you like the hard facts and mm -hmm. historically what happened or what incidents may have happened or uh, what was typical of the time, but how did you capture the, um, the more like down-to-earth things like, I don't know, just what the things looked like or uh, the way people talked um, at the time? The that stuff, we actually, like, well, f the way people talked was an interesting thing because um, we, we hired a dialogue coach to work with 
or dialect coach to work with people because um, people from downtown New Orleans actually have this interesting accent that doesn't sound like it should be coming from the American South. It comes, it sounds like almost like a, a Brooklyn, New York accent. Um, so it, it, we did, so we had to hire people who would like work with us to make sure that everything sounded accurate. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Anyone else? Uh, one more. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you a question about, uh, uh, well, when you see, when you play this game, like uh, when, when you see these uh, scenes that you've uh, shown us, mm -hmm. you're slowly walking through the city to see all those things yes. that happen there. And most, uh, uh, most players optimize the game, so they yes. rather run or they go to their car and uh, they don't see a lot of the stuff you've so, you shown us. Uh, right. Are there any ways to make player uh, to stop and see those things? Um, there are some scenes in missions where we actually have you sit quietly and watch the world um, and so that you actually can see some of the scenes play out. Um, and that was added later when we realized that people weren't necessarily experiencing all the things that we wanted them to, because we have a lot of places where we have conversations happening that you could overhear, um, and people who were playing stealth or sneaking around would hear those conversations, but people who just ran in or drove in uh, shooting are going to miss all of that content. Um, and I think that that's going to be something that we're going to try to do in, in future projects is, is well, like what Brian said in his t previous talk, is give people more space to, to, uh, to experience the world. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, then. Mr. Adam Bowman, thank you.